Welcome to the Dear Love Joy podcast special. Ooh. And it is really special today. We've got both Mark and Fina here today. Hello. Hi. Um, because we're, um, I'm having a conversation with Tom Davis, but we're recording this one live. We're actually streaming it live. We've actually done it. We've streamed it live on it Twitter. It went out. And if you weren't there, you missed out on one of the... You know, when JFK, the Apollo missions, you've missed it was out. one on of those, was it? It was. People will ask you, your kids will say, where were you? It, was, it was a bit of um, a rush to get it done. <laughs> yeah, just to- a bit. Tom had to get to the dentist. But um, yeah, so uh, it was good, though. It was exciting. We're filming it and we don't really know what we're doing with it. But we're going to start filming these, I think, um, and put them on a YouTube channel somewhere. Is that a good idea? I think so. I think so. I, I like mm. I like it. we've continued the tradition of not knowing what the hell we're doing. Well, when we first started the podcast, we didn't know how to do it. We learned <laughs> no. how to do it. And I think we've continued this. I mean, luckily we've got Fina here. She's sort of quite, quite a sensible head. Yeah. Well, my secret is make it up as you go along. So. I'm not sure your mic's in there. I can't oh, hear you. Can you not? No. Oh, Can, no. Oh. Um, what did you say? <laughs> wow. Oh, there you go. Nice. Yeah. Um, the sensible head of Fina forgot to turn her mic up. There you go. <laughs> oh, dear. Whoops. Oh, dear. So anyway, you know, Hi, it's, it is good. We did film it. And um, if you are listening to this, I, we haven't got a YouTube channel up and running at the moment, but Mark will put it in the, the description of it if we've got the YouTube channel yes. up where to go to. Um, and hopefully we'll have that done. So fingers crossed on that. Anyway, um, this is uh, exciting. It was a good interview anyway, wasn't it, with Tom? It was great. He, w- he went... Mm further than I thought he would do with personal kind of feeling type stuff. And he? He, has yeah. a, really good. and yeah. he has an interesting look on the industry as well. So um, I, I hope you enjoy this. Anyway, here's Tom Davis. This is just a guide to modern life. Modern life is hard to get just right. It can frustrate you and annoy. And if it does, right into dear love joy. Welcome to the Dear Love Joy podcast, and it's a special today's special guest is Tom Davis. Tom, thank you very much for joining me in my kitchen. Thank you for having me in your kitchen. Your, your, sec- your real kitchen. This is my time. real kitchen, yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah, because you've been in the Sunday brunch kitchen, of course, but yeah. not this one. And we're trying to record this live. Um, we don't know if it's working or not, but we've, we're, we're actually filming it, but we don't know whether it's going to go out live on Twitter or not. It's, it's quite a nice attention of not knowing at one, any point this could cut, out, cut into a live broadcast. <laughs> And everyone's just going to go, no, now you're live. Now you're yeah, live. now you're it's, live. It's literally walking on an eggshell how much I can swear and what I can say. Be, be careful what you say. You can swear, Tom. <laughs> uh, I, as every, every guest who comes on, I bought you a present. This is oh, uh, a much. bottle of uh, uh, red wine. Do you like red wine? I love red wine, yeah. Cool. Well, it's, it's a nice one, apparently. I, like, the I, bloke in the shop I was says. told as a youngster never to open a gift in front of someone. Oh. That was a... No, do it. Go on. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it this once. But do you know... <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it before. Do you, do you know anything about... Um, I'm not a connoisseur. No. Well, like, like, yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's a nice It's a nice. It's bottle. a nice drop. Yeah, yeah. Because the guy down the shop always... Um, every oh. now and then I interview people who know a bit about wine and they always go, yeah, that's a lovely drop of wine or something. That, so. I mean, it's, it's 2012. Great year. Oh, <laughs> For what? Well, not wine. That's the thing that people say, isn't it? How oh. deep does the bottom go? Is that <laughs> not the thing? It goes all the way up. Right? <laughs> it goes all the way up. My fingers coming out the top. <laughs> um, did you drink a lot when you were younger? You don't drink that much now, do you? No, I'm not a big drinker now. I used to, yeah. All my 20s was, was a pretty heavy, heavy sort of 10 years of, of boozing. Now I'm, now, yeah, I, I can't handle it now. But you I'm, were a, you were a, a scaffolder. Yeah. Did you, because it always amazes me when I know, when I hear about roofers and scaffolders, because they, they go out drinking and then they get up the next day and do that job. Yeah. It's pretty tough to do that job hungover. Yeah. I mean, I thought, well, sadly, I thought, when I first started, I was, I mean, I was sort of exaggerating slightly, but I do remember a time when people used to be on the, on the scaffold and they'd have Stellas at either side no. and they'd be drinking as they started. I mean, I'm talking about a long time ago and that was sort of folklore, really the sort of booziness of, of these guys. And then your health and safety came in and it was, you know, you obviously you couldn't drink on the scaffold anymore but or, or when you were on a building site. But certainly the sort of the guys, generations before me, it was all about boozing. And that, that was a sort of a lifestyle which very much was, you know, you'd, you're up sort of seven in the morning, you're starting work and then you're straightening the pub at three, four in the afternoon and you're doing that five times a week, six times a week. Did you ever fall off? I did, I had a, yeah, I did fall off uh one winter it had been snowing and uh 
so basic people, I mean, this is some very technological uh, <laughs> scaffolding talk. Do it. All the, all the listeners who are into <laughs> yeah. scaffolding love this bit. <laughs> oh, this is the stuff. This is the, don't talk about any of your TV or film work, Show mate. nonsense. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we want to hear some building stories. Um, <laughs> some would have moved what they call a transom, which is the, uh, like, the tube that goes across there. And it... Basically, there's a gap that you could fall through. And so a painter had moved it yeah. and he hadn't put it back. So it worked, basically come, becomes a trap, like a booby trap. And uh -huh. as I was walking along chatting to a mate, I just went right through the floor and I went smashing through about three floors of, yeah, busted my ribs. But it just actually weirdly just meant I was in the pub for even longer time. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you sort of look for those little moments. Uh, you were at the RTS Awards um, this week. Yeah. Uh, you were up against Love Island. Um, Anton Deck Saturday Night Takeaway. Um, I don't know the results. What Love happened? Island one, yeah. <sighs> How do you feel about that? You know what? It's it's nice to be nominated for when you make something like Murder and Successful. It's it's such a a show that's so close to my heart, and it's been such a massive show for me. But you, I never made it with any anticipation that it would ever take off like it has yeah. and be the thing it has. So to be nominated, especially by the RTS for those awards, is pretty. Pretty phenomenal. It's pretty amazing, um, but it's, it's it's a tough thing because I played sport at a young age, and it that out of nowhere you have a competitiveness that you wouldn't have ever had in scaffolding, or you wouldn't have ever had in most other jobs. So all of a sudden, you you don't ever think about winning anything. I never write anything or make anything going. Oh, this will win awards, but all of a sudden you're sitting in a room with loads of people who are up for yeah, you know, and you you suddenly realise you know when you watch the Oscars and you take the mick out of people going. <laughs> yeah it's really hard when you like the moment you realize you haven't won is and that's nothing against anyone who has but it's <clears> kind of soul crushing I, yeah i well, really i've never really i've been up for a few awards uh, but i've never really cared that much about about losing the ones the, the most interesting one are the radio ones though i always say awards are a win-win there's some bloke who's laughing all the way to the bank you've yeah. all had to pay to oh, man, en enter that's a crazy thing you pay to enter you pay to sit down and, and have you a pay drink. It for a table yeah, yeah, yeah you pay for everything so there's someone but then if you get an award, it helps your brand. So it's a win for you. If you get a nomination, yeah. it's a win. Everyone wins. That's why awards are great. But radio, is when you get involved in the Sony Awards, when you turn up there, people who don't win are devastated because they've got this really antiquated radar system thing where people are still writing notes in notebooks and stuff. Everyone's scared of losing their job. You get a Sony, you, you're guaranteed to keep your job for another year. You know? <laughs> and maybe you've got a little way of getting a, a pay rise. Yeah. So, so they're devastated. People in those on on the radio ones, it's it's just unbelievable watching that. I think because because we were nominated for two, so I was nominated because the show was nominated, and I was nominated. And genuinely, in my life, that's the first time I've ever been nominated or had the chance of winning anything as an individual. Like, I who played, did you go up against on that one? Uh, Charlie and Daisy Cooper from uh, this country, which is brilliant, and and uh, Michaela Cole from Chewing Gum. So it's a really, and, you know, yeah. and when you break it down, it's it's a category which is pretty much everyone who's performed in comedy over the last year. So to be in those last three is pretty incredible. But there's a part of you that's just sort of you you, you still when you're sitting there, you're like, oh mate, I've never I've never, and, and I never dreamt of even, yeah. I didn't even know I'd been put forward. So you're kind of like sitting there. And you're like, oh, wow, this is fucking crazy. And it's your job's harder than the others because your lines aren't written for you, which we'll talk about. <laughs> talk about later. You said you did sport. What sport did you do? I played football for, for a bit. I Were was you up front or at the back? At the back. I wasn't... You must have been dominated. You must have been brilliant. You know what? I was deceptively quick when I was younger, but I was also... I was never a naturally gifted footballer, but I was like a brick wall. You, it was much chance to get around you, me. Did you have trials? Nah, nah. And never oh, at that level. I, I had that weird thing of like... I was talking to someone about this the other day because I've gone back to doing stand-up and you start going back through stories and you start chatting to people you might not have talked to that much before because I always believe, you know, the characters that I, I love talking about are the people that I grew up with. Yeah. And I saw a guy that I used to play football with and he was, and it was a low level. It was like we were 13 playing in sort of like a, one of those sort of kids cup things. And he was like, do you remember that game and that goal I scored? Yeah, we're thirteen. The ball came out. You you cleared a header. It someone flicked it on. <laughs> I chested it down and I volleyed it and went in the top corner. It was the best moment of my life. And I thought we're fucking thirty eight. <laughs> <laughs> you beat too fast. But, you, but you're, I, I hate talking about your height because it's so obvious. And when I when I was just looking you up on on the internet a couple of days ago, everything's about your height. Yeah. But are your height six foot seven, six foot eight? What are you? Six, six seven. Yeah. Six seven. 
you know, you've got such an advantage over everyone else. I always say, if you give me another couple of inches, I'd have probably played for AC Milan in the eight. In the, in the <laughs> <laughs> but then, but I've, I've tipped the scale too far, Tim. Ah, right, like, okay. There's a certain, there's a perfect, t- <laughs> and people go, you know, what is the perfect guy? And I, I think six foot four, I was really happy. And then yeah. I grew that little bit too much. Yeah. Six, seven is, it's a thing where I still have a weird thing of doing this for a job, which is the best thing that's ever happened to me. But, before I even did this for a job, people would stop me in the street for pictures because I was tall. There'd be tourists. What, like, just stopping yeah, you for... Just because, you, basically, almost like a freak show. <laughs> like, people would just come up and go... So, And it still sort of happens. So you sometimes don't know if people... I've been at events where someone's gone, oh, it's right, we get a picture. And you go, oh, yeah, cool, of course, of course. Um, well, I've never seen anyone as tall as you. What is it you do? <laughs> and then you realise that your career means nothing. They're yeah. just there. They just want a picture with a tall guy. And I always wonder what people do with that picture. Yeah. If they're going through you going, do- that's so-and-so, that's so Oh, look, that's, that's uh, a tall bloke. That's a tall guy <laughs> that we met. I don't know what he you, does. You did choose the wrong sport, though, because most sports, height matters. Yeah. Golf now matters. They're all tall now. Tennis. Yeah. Um, snooker, obviously, because you can lean on the table further, uh, not use the rest. Um, swimming, you get to rugby. the other end, other end quicker. Rugby, yeah, but football, the the best player in the world's tiny, yeah. messy. Yeah, so it's weird. So I know, mean, I'd say that Peter Crouch. Peter Crouch, that. good, good, good feet for a tall yes, man. That's what they were saying. Good, for good a feet tall man. for a tall man. But yeah, I mean, boxing or anything else could have wrestling, yeah, uh, MMA. Yeah. It all should have, yeah, or comedy. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I just thought everything else feels like a lot of hard work and I'm halfway there by looking stupid. So I can just, uh, I you, can just make the most Getting of back to the RTS, do you like show business? Because I, I have this problem with these award ceremonies. Simon Rimmer, you know, my yeah, co-presenter, he absolutely loves it. He loves turning up to those things. I absolutely hate it. I love the people there, but I can't be bothered with the small talk. You look nice today. Oh, what are you up for? Or do you think you're going to win? Or what are you up to at the moment? It's just so banal and boring. And he goes, it's brilliant. We argue all the time about it. I'm, I'm sort of with you, actually. I, lo- I like the people. I like seeing people that you, you know, like there's people there that I see that I haven't seen for four or five years. One Because it's a funny job, this one. You can end up working really closely with a producer or a commissioner, but, you know, and they move on or, or you go to another check whatever it's nice to catch up but the showbiz side of it is n- not something I, I I'm particularly keen on I sort of think that it in in the last few years everything's got sort of a little bit mixed up with like reality tv and fame and when I when I was do it's the first started this my thing was to to make something I always thought you know they're sort of dead and gone away but dvds like to have something, a product that you've worked really hard at and you believed in, that's all I ever really wanted to yeah. do. To make a bit of a, a show that I believed in, that I, I, I thought, wow, that's, I've done that. And I can sort of always always have that. No matter what, if I end up back on a building site, I've made something. So, But fame is a really sort of, it's a, it's a horrible and dangerous and nasty thing. And I always think, as silly as it sounds, when we were kids and me and you were younger guys, like Gladiators was a massive TV show, right? To get and that was like the big Saturday night show. To get on Gladiators, you had to be at the top of your physical condition. You had to try to beat someone, and you had to win at something. And it was like all about if you were young watching it at home, you go, "Oh wait, I'd love to fucking do that. I'd love to like get that fit and be on TV." And everything you kind of needed a bit of that. And then sort of reality TV came along, and people would be like Joey Essex or whoever would turn around and say, "I thought Africa was in Europe." Yeah. And then he, dro- he has a Rolex and he drives the best car and, and, and everyone goes, why am I fucking going to work? Why am I grafting? I could just be an idiot. The, right? and, and it makes you feel, a young kid feel foolish. The reality stars though, when you turn up at those showbiz events, the water series, the reality stars are the ones that everyone's interested in. Yeah. Even, even the other celebrities. It's weird. You know, the, 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 the table of those, Muggy Mike will turn up or someone and everyone goes, oh, there's Muggy Mike. And some it's of them so I really bizarre. like. Some of yeah. them have become friends because of Murder and Successful. Some of them I... I, I like Mark Wright is a good mate of mine, and and, and Jamie nice Lang. Bloke, isn't he? Yeah, I love Mark. Jamie's I think, and actually, I think Mark's a credit to reality TV. I think he's actually surpassed it, and he's moved on, and he and it's not been an easy transition. But he's actually sort of making good moves, and I, I, I respect that side of him massively. I just my my problem with it is it creates such a negative way of them being. At, I've been at award ceremonies and heard them talking to to people in such a fashion where they sort of feel like they can be as rude as they like and and you sort of sit and think you know you're, you're not trading out on any particular skill yeah. you're being yourself and and you know obviously there's a market for that but they I, have I, their I, lives 
taken yeah. apart though I mean they've got no privacy like you have no. and I have they literally have nothing. they that, sign that, that deal with yeah, them. yeah they do yeah, they yeah. sign their soul to the devil yeah. but then we own them and so we yeah. can do what we want and then they crash and burn at some stage don't they all of them and yeah. then they, they have a horrible time I, but that's what I think the better one the, the ones that you look at and go oh wow you've you've been canny there. Yeah. you know you've got at just the right time to be fair to some of them who, who not even Gary from Geordie Shaw you think well actually You've you've come out of it. You've now got a kid. You've got a wife. You've walked away from that world. You've earned a couple of quid, and do you know what? You're set up. Yeah. And he's invested it in, in things. I just think it's, I I think it's a sad state of affairs that that's become the sort of biggest thing on television. Well, stop watching it then. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about gladiators, I was at a uh, um, I was at a, an event, a charity event once, and it was years after Gladiators finished, and a guy, one of the gladiators, don't know what his name was. You know, I can't think. Of, what were their names? Wolf Hunter, or something? Hunter. Wolf, or, yeah. So, so. One of them turned up in a in their gladiator outfit, and I thought, "Oh Christ, you've got to know when's the time to leave the yeah, industry." Yeah. You know well, I mean? it's, it's funny to think of the, he's got one of them, and it's made out of like yeah, 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 it at yeah, home. Yeah. Turns up with his yeah. big big <laughs> cotton bud. <laughs> Who wants to fight? The other thing I like about those award ceremonies is the celebrities who get drunk. Generally, the reality stars yeah. do that, but I always think the worst place to get drunk is in amongst all your peer group in the industry yeah. but every year there's people who staggered around like that going up to commissioning editors telling them what they really think <laughs> yeah the best bit of advice i ever had was no matter you win you lose whatever get out of dodge like yeah. don't be don't be there after like have the awards have a drink be civil but get out because seriously like the worst thing you can be is exactly is exactly that drunk walking around shouting your mouth off yeah. you're either going to come across as an arrogant prick because you've just won and you're dancing about yeah, yeah, or you're yeah. going to come across as a bitter prick because you, you've not yeah. But yeah and there's nothing in between all right listen we're going to talk about um uh, murder and success Phil action team keith lemon all that sort of stuff a bit later on but i thought i'd do the interview the wrong way around and say well, what have you got coming up yeah what cool. what are you doing soon um so it's, it's all i'm in a bit, a bit of, it's a nice time but it's a bit of a strange time so we, we've done action team, team and that's sort of taken the last couple of years and then murder was so it's been five years really of sort of constant you know, murder to action team of work like that so we're hoping the, the murder and successful film is just this thing where it's sort of burning away and it's something that i, re, I truly hope happens because i think we're not done with that yet and i think that it would be great to sort of go out on a massive high so yeah. we're sort of just we, we, i think we're nearly there with finance for it which would be amazing because i think it's when we first made that show it felt such a unique and different thing and obviously we're going to talk about it later but so that is something that we're very much we're, we're, we're sort of persevering and so i'm right and i'm writing a thing at the moment which is early days but it's a more drama sort of comedy drama but drama type thing about the wild west and uh how the american dream started um when abraham lincoln in like 1963 basically let uh, a homelet um thing where you could basically to anyone could basically get land it was after the civil war and people could apply and have land and it was the sort of beginning of saying that anyone no matter where you were from could could be anything they wanted you'd be a landowner you could have a town and, and so the, the start of it is that um and it's a sort of you know it's a western it's i'm obsessed with that genre so it's yeah but it's sort of probably for me and james who i write with and um who directs it's our sort of our closest thing to a sort of drama how do you know about that era then you, why are you obsessed with it I sort of <clears> just through re reading stuff and, and I was me and my dad my, me and my dad as, when I was a kid would, would always watch like the, you know Western's a wild bunch Jer I was going to be called Jeremiah because my dad was obsessed with Jeremiah Johnson um, who's, God, Jeremiah, like, who's Jeremiah Johnson um, he was played by Robert Redford it's an amazing film I don't think it's I've an seen it incredible that. piece of film where it's pretty much all just one man and he sort of he becomes a uh, a man of the woods and a mountain man and right. uh, you know he leaves civilization uh, and uh, yeah it's just incredible um, so yeah I, I've always loved that genre and, and like Larry McMurray and stuff like that so I was I always thought you know how do we how do we get into doing doing something like that and fortunately Murder and Successful was was so batshit crazy and so different yeah, and action team was. We sort of took the writing up a level, but also the way it looked and, and felt. So it felt natural, really, to sort of keep on going with that high-spec type idea. <clears throat> the reason why I've turned the interview around is because uh, everyone will notice you keep saying we, because you've been very clever. You're not just a um, gun for hire, are you? You've actually no. set up your own production company. Yeah. Um, who is the we, and how did you come about doing it, and why did you do it? So the we is me, James DeFrond, and Andy Brereton. So James and me have known each other since we were mid-teens. 
so that, uh, James basically was sort of the cleverest guy when we were growing up and but then he sort of left after the school he didn't go to university he started as a runner at Talkback uh, and he sort of but me and him would go out and we'd make little videos and I was going to you know when I started to stand up so we've sort of over the last 15 years really been grafting away at this um, you know it's sort of that weird thing of all of a sudden you come to the public's you know notice but I've been, you know, been around for quite a long yeah. time overnight success yeah <laughs> but it's taken me 10 years to be so yeah. um, so me and him were you know we we've sort of grafted a long time to sort of get there and then Andy Brereton was the guy I sort of developed murder with really and he's he's an incredible producer and a, an incredible like genuinely like almost a genial sort of mind so the three of us were like you know murder was such a different show and it gave us a sort of usp we were like with action team let's have some ownership so we sort of set up Vendemo and, and we we had a sort of goal so Vendemo the umbrella are they yeah, yeah right and your shiny yeah. button yeah we're shiny button shiny yeah. button because well, the first thing I ever did with sleep was with uh, Conor Maynard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I gave him a button and said, look after that shiny button. <laughs> and then it became a bit of a thing where I'd give people this button and, and they, we, we never made the cut because it, but they'd just be turning around going, what am I going to do with this button? <laughs> no, you'll know when to use it. <laughs> um, uh, so it became a bit of a joke. And, and so, yeah, it, that, it's hard to name it. It's like naming a kid, naming a company. Yeah. It was just sort of like we went through loads of names. It was like, no, just go with this, fuck it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so, so it's the three of us. And, then, you know, we've, we've got a great little team. And, but the, the idea is to make stuff that constantly feels like high in concept, stuff that isn't your normal, and, and giving people... Who, who were fans of murder, but also, yeah, we've got uh, two girls, Kate Heaven and Bryony Redmond, who are fantastic. They're, they're really talented directors and writers, and but they, they think about things in such a big scale. It's really, really exciting for them to sort of come to us and, you know, us develop them. So that's the other thing is it's just, just making stuff that isn't the norm did you did you own murder and successful as well was that your production yeah they, well that's with us and tiger aspect yeah right. so that's a sort of co-pro now with us okay. um but that was a sort of you know tiger um and endemol were brilliant because they were like look you know you have a clear goal of what the stuff you want to make and we'll, we'll support you on that and and that's what this sort of this year is really is the development of us as a so we sort of consciously were like let's let's have a year of getting stuff off the ground yeah Let's, let's let's make new stuff let's make new content stuff that was you know because then hopefully you, you get to the end of this year and you might not shoot loads you might not film loads but you hopefully have two or three really strong projects not all me centric or james centric or andy centric but stuff that we've got that's that's moving along but you must look at everything in a different way because you know if you're just a jobbing actor or not a jobbing you know you're an actor or comedian and you want to get yourself in a program you're thinking how much money am i going to earn from this yeah how much do i get paid i want to get paid more what's the maximum i can get whereas you're thinking i need to put profits on screen i imagine because you want yeah. it to look good because you want to get the next commission so you must change the way you visual you you think about your job well action team was was massively for us like me andy and james made a conscious decision that every bit of money that we would, would would go on screen just because it was the first thing that we were doing that was scripted and we had a vision and james as a director had a vision and we had a way that we wanted it to be so it would have been short-sighted to go. All right, we're going to make a, a you know, well, we can get this money and that money. Yeah. Rather than go right, let's 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 put our, our asses on the line of literally put our money where our mouth is. And what's been great about that is the way it looks and the way it feels is like nothing else that you've seen. And yeah, you know, we we basically went out and shot a, an action movie in six weeks, uh, and you'd have months to shoot that. We were doing stunts. We yeah, I thought of- I thought it was high budget because there was like people dying there's a lot of yeah. death in it yeah um and you you know there's nice nice special effects yeah, yeah. coming off it and stuff and you were thinking well this you know they spent a bit of money on this it's nice to get a big budget we yeah but we didn't we, we you know itv were great itv we we said to itv this is our vision this is how we're going to do it and they were incredibly supportive but the truth of the matter is that, that there's not as much money in television unless you've got we went straight to Sirius, so it wasn't a pilot so it was very hard to, to, to go to other people and get more money and get yeah. more investment because they, we didn't have a product to sell. So, but, but the main thing was, I think when we were making it, we, we wanted it to look, if we were going to undercut it and we opened with quite a big, you know, a dick joke, and that's our humour. We, you know, I'm unapologetic about, you know, that's the stuff I find funny. I find the course and I find stupidness funny. And, but if we're going to do that, it has to look high end. Because if it looks a bit naff and all of a sudden you're doing jig joke, the whole thing falls apart at the seams. Whereas if it looks high spec and it's played quite straight. So the idea and, and the stunts, 
the action always had to feel real. Yeah, because you, <laughs> you every t- every interview you do, the one you do with me on Sunday brunch, where you go, "Hey, you did your own stunts." I now imagine that phone call was with James or that conversation with James. How much does stunt man? What? No, I'll do them. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't was fun. Also, you, you weirdly had like it was so hard. So this, you know, I, you were on a speeding train, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. But the weird thing was when we first arrived in Bulgaria because we did a lot of the stunts in Bulgaria. The guy turned up and he was like. Uh, for Tom's stunt guy, we don't have one guy who fits him, but we have a guy who has Tom's legs and we have a guy that has his <laughs> upper body. Because if you look but, at my figure, I'm quite <laughs> big up top. I'm a bit, uh, uh, but I have really skinny legs. Yeah. So they couldn't find someone who had, so there's scenes if they were doing any shots with me where they had to shoot the legs or the upper half or the back. And so, and then there's a film, there's a bit in the last episode where, you know, Vlad and Logan are playing both and they have a showdown. So I had to fight myself, essentially. It's an amazing thing to have done. And we did it in two hours. You think yeah. like Tom Hardy, when he did it, did it in a week. Yeah, you must have that. You must sit down and have those conversations, though, which which most actors don't have, which is this sort of, sort of how are we going to get this commissioned? How are we going to pitch yeah. it? All those things. But also, how are people going to consume this? Because we're watching it on demand, aren't we? You, you yeah. must be aware with Murder and Successful, people are watching, they're not watching it go out no. at the time, they're watching it later well, on. It's a weird thing, I mean, Murder and <laughs> Successful is a case in point, and, it was, it's a, and this is credit to the BBC massively, was that when we started that off, people forget that the first series, it was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. It genuinely was that. That's and what then, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. You've been one of the big, big, biggest supporters of it. Uh, I did like it, um, yeah. But it really was like, so it took a real time to, to grow. And that's what the BBC, lucky, you know, by series two, it had grown, you know, and it, it, we'd won a cut an award. And series three, everyone can't, you know, people come into it. But it's a subjective thing, I think, when, when an action team's the same. I, I think you can only really make, and if you care about stuff, you can only make stuff that you want to make. So Murder and Successful, I, I was never like, oh God, will people like this? I was, I'm always conscious of, as a comedian, and, and as anyone who's, who's, who's making any sort of content, you have to, to make, and you have to be ready for not being the beige in the middle, not being a guy that people aren't gonna you know, remember. Like they're just gonna go, oh yeah, I think I remember that show. You wanna be like, oh my God, that was terrible, or fucking hell, that was incredible. You wanna incite some sort of reaction. Yeah. Because that's, that's what we're all trying to do. Right? Yeah, whether they like it or they don't like it, you want someone to have a, have a, a the thought process about yeah. what, you, what you're putting on screen. And, and I don't think what people realize, um, the viewers realize, is there's so many layers to get something on screen. Yeah. There's so many opinions. And, and, you know, every now and then when something amazing comes along like your show is very different the young ones when we were kids yeah, stuff yeah. like that you go how the hell did that end up on TV who who's you got to find the commissioner the genius who went I'm going to give that a go I mean I, yeah, I think that but also I think you have to as a writer and as a like this country for example now when I sit and watch that it's such a refreshing brilliantly written written piece people are just not, you know, and actually credit to BBC Three because like a lot of people wrote that off as a channel when it went online and Damien Kavanagh there has he's commissioned some incredible stuff you look at you know the budgets that constraints that they have that the, you know Fleabag people just, you know oh, yeah, he's literally had good, yeah. back to back to back hits um, and that is some of that is through the fact that actually they saw the fact that we were we were going into a world where certainly our demographic and the people who are watching our shows are going to you know pick up you know later in the week. I remember the first series of Murder went out and it went out on on TX on TV and you, you you'd have like you know, I think it went out on ten o'clock on a on a Tuesday or whatever and you'd see a load of tweets on that Tuesday, and then series two was out on on um, iPlayer. And you'd have spikes where people usually a Care- Friday, Thursday, Friday. Careful, you know. careful banging that thing because oh, yeah, it goes straight. It, no, it's going straight through the mic when you're oh, banging the table. Oh, yeah, go on, oh, carry on. Just, just for people listening. Well. So <laughs> um, but, but so we, you know, we basically then sort of saw the spikes, spikes go up yeah. and down. And now, weirdly, where action teams going out on a uh, TX in yeah. on a Monday night, you see more of a spike on a Tuesday lunchtime. Then you'll see another one on Friday evening, and you go, "All oh, right, that's, people are just." consuming stuff differently. Tuesday lunchtime yeah. who's, you have hits who's of people watching just TV on, on, on Tuesday on lunchtime on break where people will sit there and go oh, I was going to watch this you, you talk about demographics but I worry about that when people say we're aiming at this demographic because surely good TV is good TV oh yeah I mean that, and everyone when you make good TV everyone's going to watch it no yeah. matter how old they are I mean we've weirdly with ITV we've brought in 
a lot of people who are older and would usually watch ITV too. And I think that's, I, you know, again, we were never consciously going, all right, this, this is what this sort of people would like or that sort of, you know. Yeah. We're, I've actually, when it came to the final season of Murder, the thing that I was like is this has to now try and push into a little bit more like the mainstream and it has to, so you have to have names that my mum is going to know and my aunt's going to go, oh my God, you've got Lorraine Kelly doing it. Yeah. And that felt like the push of it. To, 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 to open up to that, that demographic but I don't think you can ever I think you you all you can do is make stuff that's good and that you believe in and that's, mm. the, that's the skill well, to it so just indulge just what's happening in the TV world then from your point of view that the, the live slots are still probably tea time people can still tune into TV there yeah. don't know they sit there and maybe Saturday evening su- Sunday morning uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sunday <laughs> evenings are great I'll tell you what Channel 4 recently smashed it with um <laughs> They, they just had, they, <laughs> um, but they did. My TV highlight of the last year has been the Big Little Railway. I thought that was just genius. What's that? I didn't watch it. Was, it. Oh man, it was Channel Four. It was about a group of guys that had a that built Dick Strawbridge basically built a miniature railway from the bottom of Scotland all the way to Fort William, yeah. and it was something that they couldn't do in the Victorian days with a real railway. And he basically did this miniature railway. And it was just a really, what it basically came down to is, is about relationships and people getting together to do something. But they had that and then they went into SAS, which is another one of my favorite shows. We know right. a massive contrast. But you saw people watching but, it. You know, people are... But when you're going to commissioning meetings, are, you, are people just talking about on demand now? Is, is that for your uh, starter stuff? Yeah, I mean, but I think, I think people still want to attract viewers. You still want to get people over. I think everyone knows now that I, you know, I still think that when Action Team is all out on the ITV hub, there'll be a whole other life for it because it will sit there. Because I want to binge. Sit. Yeah, yeah. I want to binge. Yeah, I do though. I, my viewing taste is now to sit. I've just watched the uh, Looming Tower, and you sit there. What's and, that? Uh, it's about um, 9/11, about CIA and the F- CIA and the FBI. The argument that's, that that is they it drama. Did. Yeah, it's incredible. Oh man, it's amazing. Where's that on? Uh, Amazon. Amazon. with Jeff Daniels right. it's a brilliant piece of work but I sat with my wife and you watch it in an afternoon yeah see yeah. I just I just hammered series 3 of Gamora and then I'm, oh do, I'm, God, do, I'm, I'm doing love and, and that's how I like doing it I like to come in and then every night do it so yeah. that's, that's so you know that's it's like save me I've got save me now yeah. ready to start watching this weekend so was there ever a thought process that you put all of the action team out on the same day all of them no not really I think it was more that you want to stagger that, I think. I think. I think that that's going to come soon enough. I think that you. I think that will have to happen where people are just putting everything out and all the contents there. But I think we wanted to try and sort of get it out. It's yeah, because yours has an arc in it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, be, be, because of that, you you want to you want to you know want, you want to binge. Yeah, and I think that's what will, what will happen. I think you know, and that we we live in a world now where the sell on is you know where where does it live next? Where does it go to ITV? Because you know, so many people are coming to British comedy now through Amazon or through, you know, Fleabag and Catastrophe were incredible on Amazon. So it's like, where do you go next? Where's the thing? Because it sort of, it sits well on the, with that arc uh, to, to sit on a streaming service as well. So it's, yeah. So how's that action team doing for you? It's good. It's, it's, been, it's been a critically acclaimed show. It's like I said, it's getting people watching it on the ITV hub. It's, it's not probably getting as many people watching it when it goes out as you sort of think. But, I'm proud of it. I think. Do you know what I love about it? Is I've, I said this to you before. It's the work experience guy. Oh just yeah, that, he's that, amazing. But it's just that element which made me really laugh. The fact that he's looking at you all the time. You guys I, going, what the, <laughs> the hell are you doing? And it's it's really nice to see it from a viewer's. You know, like he's kind of like a viewer, isn't he? Yeah. It actually written into the thing. Well, you kind of always want to have that sort of weirdly with murder and successful. It was the person who comes into the show. It was the guest. Yeah. Was your was your audience's link in and and with this it's been Coyote who is like. He's another level talented, that guy. He really is. I think he'll go as far as he wants to in the business. Because even when he's not, he hasn't got any dialogue or what, he's just in it all the time. His reactions, and if you just watch, I can just sit and watch him just in the background of a shot, and he, he's just mystical. He, amazing. As, right. what, is the, what is the writing process like? Um, do, you get, do you plot it all out first and write in the gags? Do you start with the gags? Which way does it work? We started writing it as a drama. So we, we, we thought, right, well, actually... Weirdly, weirdly, firstly, we didn't. We started trying to write it as a comedy, and it just was impossible to write like that. So we thought, right, let's write it as a drama, because our, our thing was we wanted to make something that felt like it could be like a box set, that it could just go from episode to episode. You had cliffhanger moments, 
that's how this shows that me and James watched. So when we were writing it, so we, we basically went back to the drawing board we, and we just started again and we wrote it as a sort of arc, almost like a film. That you'd, you know, like Spielberg in a sense, says every 10 minutes you have to have that cliffhanger moment. So if you watch a Spielberg film, there always that? be a I moment of romance or something. So he, And that's how every film that he's sort of done, Indiana Jones is a perfect template for that. So what we were trying to do is go, right, well, actually works really well for us because we have 10 minutes and you have a break and then you have another 10 minutes and then you, yeah. you're out sort of almost. So we, we basically knocked it down to that. And then we added, you know, undercut it. You, that's what murder successful, successful was. And the, the tone of humor that we find funny is... Sorry, what does undercut it mean? So, so you'd have a moment like the dick joke at the top or where you'd, you, everything's really high. It's basically coming in at a height of drama and then his dick's hanging out <laughs> and it's that's where you're undercutting a joke or you know or a computer you know you're doing something it's high end and the phone breaks it's always just finding that silliness and, uh, um i always assume everyone knows that but it's just me and james we talk in that language um but and that's the the tone of the murder and successful thing was what we always wanted and we enjoy is playing this ridiculousness but playing it straight like with slate i never looked at playing him to be funny, I always thought it's going to be funnier if I'm trying to make him like Denzel Washington rather than if I'm doing big jokes. And, you know, so the more dramatic he is, the more pathetic he is. So, yeah, I think with, with Action Team, it's sort of carrying that on. And that's why Vicky and Stephen and, and you sued. And you got yourself ready for the role, didn't you? You actually you actually bothered to lose weight and everything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you lost a lot, didn't you? How much did you lose? stone, yeah. But, and that's, you know, I put on my... That's Hollywood stuff, that yeah. is. Yeah, <laughs> but then you see... Weirdly, it's changed. Like, I didn't want to go down that route of putting up pictures because I think it's a bit worthy and it's a bit wanky. But, like, genuinely, like, we're out my top off and I've put a bit of a gut back on. But it's changed. Like, the guy who I did, who my personal trainer, who was this amazing Russian guy, um, he basically, he wasn't actually Russian. That's just me being really broad. He was from, I can't remember where he's from now, Lithuania, something like that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's terrible. Um, but he, he, nice. you just look at my shoulders, you know, you, you're like, wow, it's changed my whole body shape yeah. through doing that and through working out. So I was working out like five or six times a week. I was doing like Wing Chun, Krav Maga, um, Thai boxing. So I was doing stuff all the time. And, and it was literally, because I, and I think you know, when I first knew, knew you, when I first did Sunday brunch, I was sort of, you know, drinking and eating that crap. To actually then go out and go, right, actually, I've changed my whole lifestyle now. So I'm not going to go out and drink. And that, that's stayed on with me, really. So you, did you do fighting stuff prior to trying to lose weight? Not really. I'd, I'd done bits of boxing. I'd done little bits and bobs. Not really. This That was like a real, like the Wing Chun. And like when you're six foot seven trying to what do Wing, Wing Chun. Wing Chun? Is that Kung Fu? Kind of, yeah. It's like a sort of, yeah. It's a lot of speedy movements and banging taps hands away. But yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Are you any good? Are you a contender? No, no, no. The Krav Maga was pretty, Krav Maga was incredible. Right, that's the Israeli. Israeli yeah, yeah. So that's, that, isn't that supposed to be the hardest martial art or something? Yeah, but it's also, it's just using for, you know, sort of people's weight against them, but also sort of, it's quite brutal and quick. It's it's really fun. I, I, I loved it. I, I literally was like, wow. Like to think, because I was so conscious of going, right, if I'm sleep, you believe that I'm sleep because, and you know, I, I trained for 30 years to be overweight and uh, like a like a sack of shit cop. Yeah. But weirdly, if, if you're going to buy that I'm a special agent, I can't look like sleep. I can't, you know, I can't be rocking around with a gut hanging out the bottom of my shirt because it's not what a joke is. The joke was to play him high status and it's funnier when he drops down then and it's funny when stuff goes wrong for him. Yeah. Whereas Sleet is constantly pathetic. He's constantly, you know, he knows his place in the world. So it was conscious of me to go, right, these characters need to look different. And also if I'm then playing the Russian bad guy, I, I have to make him look different enough body-wise to to the good guy. So yeah. to walk with a you know a bit of a stoop and it's easier to put in some padding and make me look fatter as that guy. But otherwise I just look literally going to look the same. I've never asked this question before in an interview, but I'm going to ask it because what you just said. Did you get in a lot of fights when you were younger? Not really, no. No, I was more I was more scared of stuff. I was I was picked on a bit. I was like because you I, again, I don't want to talk about your hype. I'm going to do it because you're the big guy. Do people want to come? Yeah, and, and it's, their you know, it still happens now and again. I was like I the awful thing when I was in this, like walking through a festival, and uh, I saw the girl that I was seeing at a time, and a guy threw a can at me. And then he took his top off and flexed and he just wanted to fight. And I was like, you're insane. And there was a crowd of people. So yeah, it sort of happened more really that people, you know, and still now and again, you see it, people, people get aggressive. I've been at West Ham actually with a guy 
who was just just couldn't he, he was so like the aggressor and did he recognize you i'm not sure if it was that or he was just i think because i was chatting to people and i'm quite an affable guy and i think it's something just you know whether he whether he just had a horrible life at home yeah he just, i he made it. see i think me and alcohol don't mix as in when i'm out it's if most people i meet are just so lovely yeah and then sometimes you put me in a football scenario especially or yeah. something like that and then alcohol then someone will come up and maybe be it's aggressive to me because alcohol is just it's just gives them that little edge yeah to do and something. It's, it's a scary thing when you can see someone change completely and you know i've got friends who have been affected by alcoholism and and i sort of i think through my 20s i, I wrestled I, th- I think I until I became creative with doing stand up and stuff, and, and and that became a way of like sort of cathartically trying to do something different. I drank a lot because I was dealing with, you know, like a lot of men. I I'd, I'd worked on building sites for a long time, so I didn't necessarily ever talk about stuff that I had in my head or worries that I had. I'd drink and I'd be loud and I'd have a joke, mm. but actually it wasn't until I was creative, and and, and then weirdly I th- saw like the Professor Green. Um, documentary and, and and actually that movement of that calm have done it's, it's it's a really important thing that as guys you are chatting now about your feelings you know in in sort of late 90s and and you know me and you have talked about almost that before lag culture was such a big thing that you wouldn't have just turned around and gone oh, i feel like shit today i just feel like not getting out of bed and crying because it just wasn't it's sort of a said thing now but then it wasn't so you were you know and, and actually it's easy really easy so no matter what's going on in your life, you know, you split up in your relationship, blah, 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 whatever's going on, to go, have a go out, have a beer, have another beer, have another beer, and just put a face on. Yeah. And that's what I'd realised that I'd been doing for almost 15 years. Yeah, and eventually it breaks. Yeah. You, you break. And I mean, I talked about Alistair Campbell about this a lot on my uh, podcast I did with him. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been through really dark moments in my life, but exactly that. You, you, one day, if you're going through dark moments, you've got to wake up and go, hold on, what, yeah. am, I, what am I doing? And, then, and it's, it's really, my wife has been really great for that, but it's that weird thing of being, I think even before I did this for a living, I was, if I was on a building site, I wasn't, again, I wasn't the best scaffolder. I was a good, you know, I was, you know, but what I was great at is having a laugh and I was being one of the lads. So, you sort of had that mask. Sometimes it would be like, God, you know, having to put it on. Yeah. And and weirdly, the 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 easiest thing, the best thing was to all of a sudden you're making stand up and although you're bearing your soul in front of a room for the people you don't know, it's you're being you. You and you're talking about stuff that you'd never have spoken about before. Um that that's been on your mind. And and you know, every you realise that everyone thinks these things. But I could probably count on my hand like in the time that I worked in you know, one hand where you'd have an actual conversation with someone that would mean something more than I banged her or I did this or I fucking fought him. Most of the time it was just fucking front and there was nothing behind. And actually you go, oh, actually, you know, that's... That's kind of what men yeah. do, isn't it? Yeah. And I think yeah. I think that's where our security is and our safety blanket yeah. is in not th- not showing emotions. But you realise you respect someone so much more if you break all down that persona. And it went weirdly... What stand up did, and when I first started stand up, is the best stand ups are people that I was really like. Like someone like Mickey Flanagan on the outset is probably one of the best joke writers in the world. I mean, he's incredible. But actually, if you break Mickey Flanagan down, he is actually talking about stuff. And, it, and as a working class man, he's talking about mm. your failures, your dreams, your hopes, things that don't necessarily ever come true. And I think you'd be backstage with people. And, and for me, it was like, wow. I was never going to be the funniest person in, in that room. I was always like looking at people thinking, how do you break something down? That, how do you? I've been through a couple of serious bouts of depression and like really debilitating type stuff. And I found that some of my mates just couldn't handle it. Yeah. She so couldn't talk to them about it. And then the, the, the classic, well, you've got to be depressed about or pull your socks up or come just get out on it. Just go, yeah. <laughs> come on, let's just go out. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go clubbing or we'll go and watch a band. We'll go to football, you know, just do it. That'll kick you in your life. People nah, can't don't work it. That. Yeah. I had it when I first, weirdly. So I was very fortunate. I sort of came into this game. I'd done stand up. I got, I did a bit of radio and I did the Morgana show and I did and a pilot for Channel 4. And it, it was like, wow, this is really going well. And then for like a year, nothing happened. I, I couldn't get an audition. I couldn't buy a job. I was like, 
you know, I'd gone from like, wow, you know, flying yeah. in and, and, you know, to literally nothing. For a year, it was like, and, and I'd had no training, so I had no background in this game. So I sort of have been really fortunate to crack on. And I found myself there, that was probably the time where I look at it and go, oh, I was, man, I was really depressed. I was really down because I'd gone from a place where, like, I knew my I knew my nine to five. I knew my week. I knew everything had been on a schedule, and all of a sudden there wasn't a schedule. There wasn't anything. And actually, so what? The most important thing for me for me to do was find like now with my wife. What you realise is our lives are like a helter skelter. They're like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up. Sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're going round and round and fucking you know. Yeah. But, but what you need to do is find something that's more important than than the job and that roller coaster so with my wife it was the thing of finding someone who's a rock something you'd like literally no matter where I was in my life whether I was up or down I'm coming back and I've got someone who that's not that's not their importance their importance is me and my health and I think that's the most important thing for me when you when you break down this game well you talk about going into this industry you, you got in through quite a strange way didn't you you said yeah. you and was it you and James were making yeah, yeah, yeah. making so, yeah. and then he was working with Keith Lemon is that so right? yeah he was a producer on He'd done Bo Selector. Yeah. So when I first knew Lee, he was he was sort of, I think he'd just finished Bo Selector. So let's just go back. You, you left school, you end up on the building sites yeah. and the market trader. And, 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 and I did chefing for a bit. Chefing. Yeah, little bit of but were you, in the back of your head, were you always thinking, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a star. No, <laughs> I no. should be on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I sort of, I, ne- I never thought it would get to this level, this, this far. Yeah. And I just, uh, I think it was just waking up one day thinking, fucking hell, it can't be just this. I'll tell you actually what it was. It was a, there's a book called Billy and it's written by Billy Connolly's wife. Right. And it's actually looking to, like her as a psychiatrist looking at yeah. Billy Connolly. And there's a passage in the book, and I've talked about this quite a lot, but where Billy Connolly says he's on the, in the shipyards and he's learning to play the banjo and he's thinking about going professional. And he turns to an old guy and he says, oh, you know, next year, I think I might go professional. And the old guy says, oh, you won't never, you'll never do it because next year will come the year after and the year after and the year after. And you need to know that there's nothing worse than being an old man sitting in a place like this, realising that what could have been. And I sort of there for, I'd watch, like, I'd go to loads of comedy clubs and watch people and think, oh, fuck, I'd get out there for five minutes and do that. That can't yeah. be that hard. Even if, even if it never goes anywhere else, apart from just standing up there and at the end of a week going, I've worked five days a week on the scaffold. I'm just going to go and try that. And even if it was just enough just to get up there and have something a bit different from the norm. And I was fortunate and it, you know, for the luck of the gods. But yeah, we, we sort of, we showed, um, we showed Lee something and, and, and he was, he was great, man. He was like, you know, I can't. I've, I've never met Lee. I've only ever met Keith Lemon. Yeah. And as it is, it's famously known, Keith Lemon stays in character as Keith Lemon. So I have no idea what Lee Francis is Lee, like. I mean, this is the thing, because for me, he's sort of, like James is without a doubt the most important person in my career. He's, James has, you know, done everything, you know, I've done everything with him. And we, we've, you know, he, he sort of give up, gave, we gave up our weekends and yeah. lives that we do now. But Lee, uh, Lee Francis is, is is incredible as a mentor. I learned so much how to conduct yourself on set, how to you know, with your clear vision to, to make stuff that you believe in. You know, you look at Bo Selector and and how crazy that seemed at the time. So Lee, and and as a friend, he's just always there. He's always at the end of a phone. He's he's a good, he's a really good <clears> man. As I say, I've never met him. I've only met Keith. And Keith, when he first came on Sunday Brunch, I was so worried about it because you know he's so wild. And I'd been on. Um, uh, celebrity juice and guys vulgar and i thought oh, what, you know as a presenter i i, mean, I don't care yeah. what he says but i've got to protect the show so yeah, you know yeah. you've got to you've got to always apologize when people have overstepped the mark and i was thinking oh, i've got my work cut out today and he was just absolutely brilliant he's yeah. such, you say he's such a pro he knew exactly how to aim it yeah he was funny he was charismatic we couldn't you know we couldn't wait to get him back on screen basically every time we we, we you know we were putting him in more items more items he just made he brought the studio alive he's fantastic he is incredible to watch and, and i think probably the most underrated genuine actually co- comedy writer and performer because you see stuff i don't know the first thing i sort of got note for was a thing called shimon selector yeah. which was him doing the, after michael jackson died he did the death of that Bo selector character and some of the stuff he does in that is just like if you think if you were 
he, I don't think he ever got the acclaim for that that, he, that particular piece. Go back and watch it. It's, it's mesmerising. He's just incredible. In so it? how long was it when you started doing stuff? Because you obviously, when you first arrive, you probably think I'm a bit of a chancer here. I'm a bloke off the yeah. scaffoldings, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm standing here in show business land. How, how long did it take you before you felt part of it? I think Murder and Successful. I think it was 10 years. It was really? Time, yeah. All that, all that yeah. time? I think because... I think people have a perception of you that uh-huh. they think is, oh, that's, you know, that, and they, they, but it's successful because of the, how it is and the uniqueness and, and the difference. It was the thing that weirdly felt like people going, oh, right, he's not just, even people who'd never met me or, or the, the scaffolder thing is, is 10 years ago and it's, it's still, it, it'll always be talked about. And I talked about Paul, to Paul Whitehouse about this because it is, there's not many of us who go, come into this game and, and are from that background. There's, there's just not. Yeah, who have proper jobs first. Yeah, yeah I've had a lot also, of proper jobs. when your proper job is yeah. being on a building site, right. it's a weird thing of Yeah, going, mine wasn't quite that. Mine was closed shops, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but so, no, but it's a similar thing. There's not a lot of us. Didn't get my hands dirty though. <laughs> <laughs> um, calluses. Um, so I think people had forged an opinion yeah. of me before or, or they did sometimes meet me. And, uh. and yeah, I th- so I think Murder and Success was the first time that I felt really like, oh wow, like, and that's not everyone. I just think, gen- in genuinely, I felt like across the board, people have now gone, oh, right, he, he's he's good. How cool is that though? I was talking to Paul Whitehouse about it. Yeah, okay. My, Michael Caine's told me so many times, you know, <laughs> <laughs> don't name drop. That's what he said. No, Paul Whitehouse though, he's such an amazing guy, isn't he? It's so he's... so amazing that you now hang out with all these people after after coming from that background yeah. where you thought I'm going to be. But weirdly though, the people that I've become really good friends with tend to be from similar similar backgrounds from similar right the people within like yourself like i, I get on with i chat to you but you're you know you're a similar guy from a similar background people just enough in those guys that are good friends of mine ramesh actually is one of my really good friends funny guy yeah but ramesh the great thing about rom is rom was a teacher for years so we sort of know the outs sort of i that think it's of important me. to make yeah. it to to do that proper work first yeah i think it's really important because also you makes this, you really appreciate what I agree, and that's the thing, and it sounds corny, and you sort of, I appreciate, I'm humbled every morning I wake up, to do this for a living is is genuinely like, it's like you've rolled a double six every day, it's like your hand of cards is amazing, you you literally go through life going, that's my, my job is essentially to dick about with my mates, Yeah, and I was at school, and uh, I was like, I was sort of the kid from, I remember being pulled up in front of the class by a teacher, and going, out of Tom Davis and Christine Burwood, who do you think is going to get further out of life? Who's going to do better to the rest of the class? And everyone went, like, Christy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what she does now. I'm not afraid, but sort of. So life had given up, and this is weirdly a thing that I, do, I started doing quite a lot of work with a charity called Interfilm, which works with kids from bad backgrounds and whatever to try and get them into making stuff. Because the worst thing you can do is for a kid is take away like hope yeah. and, and dreams. Because even if those dreams aren't fulfilled, like the the truth is to take it away and go like ridicule a kid. Because he goes, I want to be a comedian. I, I remember going down the job centre and they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an actor and a comedian. I said, oh, that's not realistic. What, what is it now you want to do? I said, I'll be an astronaut. Yeah, the thing changed for me was when I started telling everyone, yeah, I'm going to be a TV presenter and everyone just laughed at me. And then yeah. this guy called Chris years later came up and said, do you know how much shit you got behind your back because you said yeah. you wanted to be a TV presenter but it was the only way I could do it I had to yeah. actually tell people I was going to do it I knew I was going to get grief but otherwise I was never going to do it I was going to be the guy who never you know who who, who never had the balls to do it you've got to start, at one stage start telling people that's what you're going to do and yeah. then believe it and go for it and, and, and in the end it, and also when you come from a background such as that yeah. you have that weird thing of and I still really worry about it happening one day is that thing of going no matter what you've won what you've done where you've been that one day you've got to walk back in that pub and they go, ah, you fucked that, didn't you? I told you it wasn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Murder and Success, Phil. Um, I, we got viewers from all over the world listening to this or listeners on the podcast. Um, uh, tell us what it is. How do, you, how, how do you describe it if they didn't know? We've talked about it a lot. but So it's, it's, uh, it's a murder mystery with a, uh, a celebrity guest who comes in and it's impressionists playing the people who make up the town. Uh, so Simon Cowell would be the mayor, Alan and Jimmy Carr are like the Cray brothers. Uh, and there's been a murder, and, and I, as a D- cap, uh, character DIC, I helped them solve that murder. It's it's so many, it's a weird thing. Whenever we pitched it, it was, it, that it, even now, and this is three years of making that show, I yeah. really don't know how to sum it up at times. Uh, and it's sort of almost like, but then people watch it and go, oh, I get it. Have you sold it into America yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're chatting about it. It's, 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 there's, there's sort of two places that have, really made a real 
sort of bid for it. But that again, so this is a business thing. Make the film and then go, right, well, in America, we have more license if the film's a success or even if it's, you know, a cult hit. But if you really want to do it, do you want to sell it or do you want to go over to America with your production company, with how we make it and you sell it to America with us all in it or you sell it to Netflix. I mean, Phone up so. Ricky Gervais, ask what he did. <laughs> well, he's, he's like <laughs> that worked for guy. him. Whatever he did, it worked for him. Well, he's, he's the like, office. He's, Jeez. he's the guy though, isn't he? He's oh, so incredible. Have you, his new stand-up's just... I haven't seen it yet. Is it good? Yeah. I love him. On right? Netflix, you know, right? Yeah. And you know what? He, he um, I think Ricky's weirdly, you know, he, he's a, when you look at Ricky as, a, as a, a guy who comes from a similar background actually, what I love about him is he's out there and he's going toe to toe with anyone. Yeah. And there's something, there's something so unapologetic about that. And it's something that is, you look for, in this industry, you constantly have to look for inspirations and people that you look at and go, right, you know, he can do that. I could do that. And I think like Ricky's one of those people where I look at him and I think, you know, he, he sort of gets, you know, he's just, he's just an incredible, like massive inspiration for me. Well, what, what, are there any other comics coming up at the moment that you think we should be keeping an eye out for? Um, well, it's, been, it's, got, it's that weird thing of people. There's a show going to be called, that's called Staff, which is um, Staff Sells Houses with Jamie Dimitri. Jamie, and Jamie Dimitri from in, and that this people who know comedy know Jamie, and I, I think he's just like he's just. Uh, we had him on. He played Zayn Malik in Murder and Success, Successful, <laughs> and he's just. I can't even put it genuinely. There's seldom that you see someone who blows you away like Jamie does. He's yeah. just inc- like an amazing performer. He is so nuanced in everything he does. And but then his sister Natasha Dimitri and her friend Ellie White, we're working with them on a thing at the moment, and they're just in- there's a whole little scene. Liam Williams is a ph- phenomenal writer. There's a little gaggle of those guys that you sort of look at, and and they're just they, they do stuff that's not the norm. That is just brilliant and that they're understanding a character comedy which is sometimes can be sort of you know not necessarily sort of like viewed in the same sort of way that say stand up or something but their 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 way that they can portray and make someone come real and, and vulnerable and loved about is just, it's just murder and successful is all about you isn't it because you can only write so much of the script and so much of because you've got ad lib around what the celebrities are doing yeah. and they're funny they made me laugh. Deborah Meaden was great. Um, uh, Jamie was Richard Osman. Richard after. Osman was was priceless. He just yeah. corrected you on absolutely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he, he was weirdly. He just worked because my my use of long words, even in real life, is is you know, like he he was he was. I mean, Richard actually again someone because he works at Endemo and he's he's someone I you know count as a friend and he's. He's again just because he, he's a producer as well, right? Yeah, we had so, him on this podcast. Yeah. He, he, he taught me more about the TV than I yeah. than I knew. Yeah, he's he's like, a phenomenon. You know, he's crazy. He brilliant. just understands yeah. it. And, he does. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, but but the, the, I tell you, the show is is made up of. It, I think a lot of people think that it's just thrown together and we just turn up and we do the crazy. Yeah. But actually, the truth of it is, there's so much thought that goes into it. On the run up to it, you 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 net you know, you're working your ass off with the you know Luke Kempner will come in he's playing um tom daly and uh, his horse has been killed so we're going on with chris yeah. kamara so you play this whole thing with so you play it and you're so i'm surrounded by andy as a producer avril as a producer james defron so you're all surrounded by an amazing group of people that know how it works but when you're face down with it it sort of in the end it is right it's just you and cammy and, and what's cammy gonna say and how much footage do you need to to create the the the, the what's the end I'm, time of the I film think the end time come in about two and a half hours maybe two hours two, I'm, and I then never you cut it down to what what's the what's the final half hour 30 exactly minutes. 30 minutes yeah. and that's james's that's where james's works magic and we have callum who's an incredible editor and he's, he's done everything we've ever done so those guys but james is you know i, I sort they of are always, so good i always think i'm up front doing that sort of you know all that sort of stuff or i, I guess i'm in midfield doing it and james is the finished art what, what i love about it is when they go um zayn malik and then someone comes on you, you immediately think it is yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's amazing how that works but that's down to the quality of the guys who come in we, we've you know this country we forget how we're blessed and through for yeah, but years they, of, but their impressions are not no, but they, accurate. No, you they just should, you just immediately you start talking to him as though he's saying, "We go, yeah, yeah." It's that. We never <laughs> it wanted it to be it just works. Um, seen as a sort of uh, like an impression show. We always yeah. want it. Some of them are like you know, Luke Kempner is incredible. He does an amazing. Yeah, and then when White House came in and did Len Goodman, 
it, you believed that he was Ben Goodman, <laughs> but it wasn't like a bang on impression. Oh, it's brilliant. just Paul. Yeah, Paul is just that's a, it. I mean, that is, yeah. that was of everything I've done. That was up there with the most surreal things. I've yeah. grown up far show and, and oh, was, 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 was everything when I was when growing I, up. When I worked on The Big Breakfast, one of my favourite ever, um, I was a producer there, but I think I was a researcher at the time. I can't remember now, but Paul Whitehouse was on the show. And watching him live on breakfast TV yeah. for two hours was just immense. I just couldn't take my eyes off how amazing he was. Animated, thinking, oh. looking, looking, thinking, looking. He's just, he's analysing it all and then the line comes out and he's funny. He's oh, just man. funny, funny man. They, like they, when I've watched that scene back, it's, I think it's the most I've corpsed. And it was like, wow. You, I tell you, it felt a little bit like, you know, when you see a boxer and they yeah. get in a ring with someone and they're young. And it's a bit like, you know, Joshua, when he got in a ring with Klitschko and Klitschko still had a few tricks. Yeah. And you really got to be at the top of your game. He just, so, he just, he, oh, just he just kept switching voices he's, and characters and stuff though. Oh. He, I think it was Checkers on the show I did. And, and, he, and he just kept going into sort of checkers. <laughs> checkers. It was really funny. You know, he did the, yeah, the, yeah. the DJ stuff. The, oh, um, smashing nicely. Yeah, smashing. He kept on going into that. And that was it's, just really funny. You know, so. they, they were all yeah. great, those guys. All right, I'm conscious of time. We had Harriet Harman on here and she had to leave because she had to go to Prime Minister's Question Time. Alistair Campbell had to go um, to discuss <laughs> Brexit. you got to go. she got to go to the dentist. <laughs> I mean, for God's sake. I've been up, we're being upstaged by a dental practice. Turning out the dentist with a bottle of fire red wine. <laughs> <laughs> so we got right on, we got questions you'll have to come back and we'll we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, no, we'll no, get we'll get more stuck into it but um look, I've got questions we ask all the guests which come on so we'll do this with you what one piece of advice would you like to give our listeners that has been invaluable to your life i was going to say the billy Connolly thing to, to to go with your go with your dreams and and, and chase it down because it is people's fear of failure is yeah. the worst that's it's always for me is like Oh God, I'd love to do what you do, but the, I just worry about it not going right. And you think, well, no, the the the, the point is just jumping and just going right. I don't know how this is going to end up, but I don't want 40 years of what I'm living right now. Yeah, that's true. But I always say the recipe is you've got to follow your dreams, but you've also got to work out what you're good at and work out yeah. what you're bad at. Because there's no point in going, I want to play for. Oh yeah, I, mean, I want to play for Milan. Want, yeah, and then or, or, you, you know you got. Or everyone's just going to be that guy who turns up the X Factor. Yeah, going. Yeah, I can sing, and yeah. you're like someone should have told you you can't. Yeah, but, work out what you're good at, and then yeah. go for it, and that's it. Um, but also, it's it, though yeah. bizarrely, I, I <laughs> I'm not sure I'm good at this. I just turned up and did it. And <laughs> no, but I think weirdly, got with the stand gig. up is stand up is it's like snooker or darts. You can get good at it after time. There's people. I sit and watch and I've seen them go from there to, to literally strat to the the Are you going back to stand up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started a few gigs and How are they yeah. going? It's, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's so scary. Because also going back it. to it without because my life I gave up stand up like six years ago. Yeah. And in that six years I got married. I, my life has changed. Six oh. years ago I was a very different person. So all of my material has changed. All the stuff that I find yeah. funny in my life. And you have to be truthful I've yeah. stand up. You you embellish stuff. You know, a bit of advice I was given when I was working on scaffold was, you know, you're from South London, you've got a God given right of bullshit. So, <laughs> um, so you have to, but you have to, yeah, you have to find out, you know, your stories, your life is different. That's that. When we edit this one day with all the people, what's the best bit of advice you, you give to our listeners? Suggs is, Suggs is um, was one of my favourites. It um, uh, doesn't matter how many pints you've had when you leave the pub. Before you leave the pub, go to the toilet. Yeah. And, eat that. and yours is, if you come from South London, you've got the God-given right to bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one we're going to edit in. Right, what mistake do people make? It could be maybe doing your job or anything else. What, what's a glowing error you can see? I think people worry, worry too much about what other people are doing i think you see it all the time and you see people stutter in in every part of life where if you're so it's like if you're running a race yeah like oh just run it with blinkers on don't worry about who's left and who's right and how fast they're going just worry about you getting to the end of the finish line and, and you running a good race great advice it's a mistake that you see people constantly do it, especially in this game stop living everybody else's lives yeah, and live your stop own worrying yeah. about it yeah don't 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 worry about whether mix got a ferrari it's, it's not a, yeah for yeah. me it was always uh, I've got to be honest for me it was always I can't believe he got the job and I didn't yeah. I can't believe it was always and I've, I've had a pretty decent career 21 years or something on screen yeah. so it's but, not but, bad. But, but worry about you and worry about how you're going yeah. you, know, you don't worry about writing on Facebook about slagging someone off because they've got a, they've got yeah, a better chance I, or just Go and write I a joke. Go and write ten jokes. I go discuss and, this with Mark uh, often. It's like if you're if you're about to go onto Twitter and slag someone off, think 
is this really what my life's come to? Haven't yeah. I got something better I can do yeah, with my yeah. life? Don't worry about it. Stop yeah. living their life and worry about yeah. their life. Worry about your as own. As soon as you can get over that, and we all suffer from yeah, it. Yeah, Just go yeah, yeah. And, and, and I wish I'd known that. Yeah, make you happier. Ago. Yeah. Uh, any life hacks? Uh, you know what is? I don't know. I, I, it's a weird one. Life hacks. I was looking at this, thinking about eat, uh, cooking. Yeah, do it. But it, do a cooking one or an eating one. Is I don't know. I, th- I think just not drinking weird is my biggest life hack. <laughs> I was like thinking about all these really spiritual deep things to talk about you uh, to you, and uh, then I was just like, the biggest thing that's made my life better is not getting pissed and and not going out and not thinking that and and worrying that if I didn't drink I'd lose friends yeah. and I'd lose any kind of social interaction uh-huh. worrying that like oh if I'm not going down the pub with the lads for like 10 pints am I ever going to see them again yeah. or am I going to go to football if I'm not drinking and actually no one gives a shit I think a few again, do a few do yeah but then then why are your mates with them I think yeah, that's the thing do. it's like if people have got a problem with something you're doing to further your life to yeah. make you better do you need them in yours that idiot who turns up and you're, you're there and you're not drinking yet he buys around and puts a pint on and goes get that inside yeah, you're yeah, like, I'm yeah, not yeah. drinking no come on they're the idiots yeah, so yeah. life hacks is, yeah, yeah that's probably it yeah, yeah. Have yeah. control over your drinking habits um, any books you recommend I'll tell you I've just read Harry Finley's book The Dog Harry, it's incredible. Harry the dog is that it's the basically it's, bloke? it's yeah, but it's about a guy who was he he was a horse trainer and dog trainer, and he did this amazing sort of a scam where he he basically got a load of guys on mopeds and moped, uh, motorbikes to go and hit a load of bookies at the same time with this massive bet, and people wouldn't take the bet off him, so he basically ran it like a military mission to make this. Right. And he made like I think it was like eight million. I can't remember exactly the but it's an incredible book. And actually, so he's a guy who was a sort of chance, a bit of a gambler, but now used that money to set up Have I made his name up, Harry the Dog? Or was that no, it's Harry the Dog Finlay, yeah. And and he went... Um, and, and was he a Millwall fan? Have I made that up? No, I don't know if he was. No. I, can't, I can't remember if he was. I think Millwall. that might be a football hooligan. But, um, yeah, it's not that guy. <laughs> um, but then he know. went out and... Um, and he invested the money in like schools in Africa and India and hospitals. Oh, so he yeah. actually went and did all his chari- amazing charitable stuff. And are you reading that thinking, rights to this, I've got to buy the rights to this? Yeah, I read yeah. everything like that. We, I've just read a book called Wiggers with Attitude about a kid from Leeds, uh, Derby and Leeds, uh, Andrew Emery, who wanted to be a uh, the sort of uh, hip hop star. And it's all about him trying but failing constantly to do it. And it's, it's a bit like Fever Pitch as a book. So we just got the rights for that. Oh, brilliant. Show. How long are you last to keep the rights for? I don't know how long it is. What right. are you thinking about waiting to? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, people go, I bought the rights. You go, how long for? It's like a year. Then you've got to get the commission through and you've got to get all the, the people who the he, money, you've got everything. Guy. All right, okay. some, yeah. um, uh, what is the meaning of life? Happiness, right? I think it's to strive to be happy. You can spend so much time, I think, feeling down and, and walking about. It's, it's back going back to what I talked about, like worrying about other uh, sweating the small stuff i'm guilty of it i I worry too much about stuff and i I can sometimes go for a day where i've just all i've done is stressed and actually i'll get home and take my dog for a walk and i'll smile (laughs) i just think that's you you strive to 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 spend your time with people and doing things that you're going to get that little because that's not going to happen all the time you'd be ridiculous if you walk around your whole life with a big smile on your face you'd be sectioned but you need to you need to just try and find your your happiness where you can get it yeah and the final question i've just added this one recently is there an afterlife um just a small question yeah, oh jesus wait i finish, finish jesus show. well if you believe in jesus yeah, then uh, there is yeah I, i'd like to think there is i'd like to think that you could sit and have a ruby with uh, all the people that you've sort of touched your life and go god you fucked that up didn't you <laughs> <laughs> listen thanks so much for Thank coming for on the podcast me. if people want to follow you where do, what's your twitter uh, handle I'm, uh big tom d on twitter and mr yeah. big tom d on, you got it wrong the other day you tagged a picture of me and you put my name in wrong oh did i i'm so, stu- <laughs> I'm so stupid i've waited stuff. Yeah, I've literally grown up with you, oh. watching you. It was one of my proudest moments, and so, you put it wrong. Sorry about that, mate. <laughs> right. um, tell me, tell me where, tell everyone where they can watch your shows. Murder and oh, Successful uh, is that still available? Murder and Successful is still available. I think series, series three on iPlayer and Action Team is on the ITV Hub, and it goes out Mondays ten o'clock. On both ITV worth too. watching. Both brilliant. Thanks so much. 
Thank Cheers, you very much. Uh, we'll be back soon on this podcast. By the way, if you want to contact us, I'm on my Twitter at Tim Lovejoy. You can email me, dear Lovejoy Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, subscribe to us, rate us. Hope you enjoyed it if you watched it live on Twitter. Did it work? Well, yes, it oh, worked. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I didn't swear. Yeah. Yeah, no, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Stop swearing. I got texts from my mum going, tell the bloke to stop swearing. (laughs) Uh, Brilliant. We'll see you all soon. Thanks. Cheers, Tom.